I'd like to invite you for a moment, if you would, to give me the next 12 minutes of your time. Before you do so, though, you should know you will never be able to commoditize this time. At no point will somebody give you the opportunity to buy anything or have anything new because you spent 15 minutes with me, ever. I'm asking you to do so willingly. Does that sound okay? As we do that, I want you to know I want to talk about only two things today. I want to talk about, on one hand, individuals, and I want to talk, on the other hand, about everything else in the entire world. I'm going to do that in 12 minutes, which is hard. It takes me longer than that to find my keys. We have this system set up in the world where individuals spend their time in little blocks. And they do it through an agency. Normally, that agency does something they care about or pretend to care about. And then that individual's time in little blocks goes to help some other individual. It's interesting. We feel good about it. The best example I've ever seen is at the Louise Dean School. The Louise Dean School takes young, poor, teenage moms that want to get a high school diploma and don't have one. And it gives them the opportunity to go to class. And if you want to volunteer there, you can cuddle their infant babies while they learn. You go there and you get a baby and you get to cuddle it. It's amazing. It's amazing. The teacher gets helped because they've got a student they can teach. The baby gets helped because it gets cuddled. You get helped because holding the baby's awesome. The staff member gets helped because they get to go get a cup of coffee while you're holding a baby. And of course, the mom gets helped because she's learning and thinking, knowing her baby is safe and being cuddled. It's amazing. But what it does do, this whole system means we're all the same. It gives us a lack of choice. As individuals that want to give our time, we've got to choose from the organizations that exist. There's no other way to do it. And as individuals that need our help in our community, it means that you've got to choose from the suite of services provided by agencies you didn't help fund, you didn't help build, and you don't work at. And it wasn't always this way. I'm from St. John's, Newfoundland, and I, one of the things I love most about St. John's is that things change slower there. Things move slower there. And so we had this community, even when I was a kid, where people took care of one another, where people knew about their neighbors, about their stories, even their names, believe it or not, and were willing to help them, not if the opportunity came up, but they'd make the opportunity. That was a time that we were happy sweeping our floor with straw brooms. We're not anymore. We no longer think of community in the same way. We have a new duty. It used to be our duty to be a social citizen. It isn't now. Now it's our duty to be an economic citizen. We don't think of the social fabric of our world. We think of the economic fabric of our world, and we do that for a bunch of reasons. One of them, our families are smaller, and so our cousins are less likely to be our next door neighbors. Two, whenever we go anywhere or do anything, there is something telling us to buy a thing. And so our job now is to consume something. And if we weren't sure, if we had some sort of dissonance in our head, we didn't know, am I social, am I economic, am I both? This is confusing. All you have to do is think of history and think of our governments. On September the 12th, 2001, the United States, the day after the most horrendous attack in this continent's history, the President of the United States got up, George Bush, he gave a rousing speech about something I couldn't understand, and then, Somebody asked him a question from the gallery and said, President Bush, what can we do today? What can we do right now to help? And the President of the United States said, go shopping. He said, if you want to help the world today, you should go shopping. And when I heard that, I didn't understand. And, and even in our own election in Canada, if we think about what happened in the last election, the number one issue is the economy. Go turn on the news. The first story is about the economy or about how a thing happened affected the economy. And so now we are concerned about the financial welfare of our communities, the financial structure, and we need to be thoughtful about that. What does it mean to us? It's not inherently good, nor is it inherently bad. It just is. And if we think about it, if we think, what does it mean to me? to be a financial actor instead of a social actor. I think we're going to come up with some new thoughts. And if we're conscious about it, I bet we'll think, wait now, if it's my job to think about money, whose job is it to think about people? 
And I argue if we're content with letting our government say we need to think about money, we need to tell our governments they need to start thinking about people. They need to start thinking about people. Some would argue governments can't do that. Governments should be smaller. Government can't, can't, can't take care of people. It's too big a problem. To them, I would ask, what's the weather going to be like next week? I say that not to be trite. I say it because I don't know. I say it because if I got everybody on my street together over at my place and we stood on the balcony and looked up at the sky, even if a meteorologist lived next door, we would have no idea what the weather would be like next week. Without the government putting satellites in the sky and towers across the north, we don't have the information. The problem is too big for individuals and small groups to solve themselves. And so the government has decided, wait, now people want to know what the weather's going to be like. I can do that. That's a big problem. Well, we've got some money and we've got some expertise. Let's figure it out for people. Do you know that today in Canada, we have 3.2 million people living in poverty? 3.2 million people out of 30 million people are poor today in our country, one of the wealthiest in the world. And it's because we're busy buying Swiffers and our government is busy telling us to buy Swiffers. No kidding. And so let's be thoughtful about what it means to go out and buy a Swiffer. Let's also be thoughtful for a moment and realize if there's 3.2 million people poor, we're on the wrong track. Man, we are lost. We are lost in the woods. There are moments that we are cavemen and cave women, stuck in the back of a cave that's dark and our eyes are closed and we're searching for something that may not even be there. And it's confusing. And we felt that way before. As a people, we have lost our way and been blinded by our own ambition and thoughtlessness in the past. And I call that racism. There was a time in our lives, in our lives, that hate drove the way we thought so much that the color of somebody's skin determined their future and determined how we thought about them. It is driven by hate. I would argue that the opposite of hate is not love. We all love. I think the opposite of hate is indifference, is the malignant indifference that we feel each and every day when we go to work and buy a Swiffer and go home and think of our families because they're important, but we think of almost nothing else. And this malignant indifference is what's permeating our communities and our culture. The world is ours to change. We can be indifferent or we can be engaged. People sometimes say, Dan, I understand you want to change the world. And I say, yeah, I do. They say, but there's all these structures in the way. There are all these problems. And I say, you're right. There are a lot of structures in the way. There are a lot of problems. And we made them. We are people. With the exception of Mother Earth, everything else that is, is ours. We own it. We made it. We can change it if we decide to. But only if we're thoughtful and we choose to and we can't do it alone. We need to do it together, and we need to tell our governments and our pillars of power, we need your help. This is not an issue that can be let stand. 3.2 million people living in poverty in our country right now, today. My friends, silence is content, consent. Silence is consent, and participation in a broken system is endorsement of that broken system. We can either take our time today and make some noise and make some thought or we can go on about our business and not think about what it means to have 10% of our country living in poverty today. Today. And if you agree with me that silence is consent and that participation is indeed endorsement, we have no choice but to act. And we can, there are ways to act, and there are people that will help. Courage, my friends. It is never too late to build a better world. This is Tommy Douglas, he is 
not by my definition, but by others, our greatest Canadian. He gave us universal health care. And without that type of foresight, without that type of thought, without that compassion, we will be left to stagnate in the way we are right now. If instead we choose to get up, if instead we choose to change the world, we can do exactly that. I would urge you to start with your neighborhood and then your city. Then I would suggest we really look at our nation and after that, we can change the world. Thank you.